Hello and welcome to my presentation on CRISPR-Cas9. Firstly, we'll start off with what CRISPR-Cas9 is exactly and what it does. CRISPR-Cas9 is a unique and modern technology that enables scientists and researchers to edit parts of the genome. The genome is the complete set of genes and genetic material in an organism. They, the scientists edit the genome by removing, adding and even changing sections of the organism's DNA. It is currently thought to be the most simple, precise, versatile method for genetic manipulation today. It is therefore causing a massive buzz around the world. So how does CRISPR-Cas9 actually work? There are two important molecules of the CRISPR-Cas9 system. Firstly, the enzyme called Cas9 plays a hugely important role. This enzyme is known as a restriction enzyme and means it can cut two strands of DNA at the same time, which is known as a double-stranded break. It can do this at a specific location in the genome. From this double-stranded break, bits of DNA can be added or removed using DNA repair pathways, therefore causing a change in the DNA. Next we have the guide RNA, or known, or known as gRNA. This is a small and designed RNA sequence, usually around 20 bases long, and it's located in a longer, larger RNA scaffold. The scaffold binds to DNA and the small gRNA guides the Cas9 enzyme to the correct part of the genome. Therefore, the gRNA essentially ensures the Cas9 enzyme reaches and cuts the correct part of the genome. So how exactly does the guide RNA guide the Cas9 enzyme to the correct location in the genome? The guide RNA is designed to identify and bind to a specific DNA sequence in the, in the target genome. This is because the guide RNA is designed to have complementary bases to a specific sequence in the genome. Uh, so complementary bases are, for example, adenine to tyamines, A to T, cytosine to guanine, uh, C to G, and vice versa. The target sequence is usually a specific gene, uh, which is a part of the DNA that carries info to make a protein slash encoder protein. So for example, if the target DNA sequence has bases of CTG, the guide RNA will have bases of GAC. Um, therefore, in theory, the guide RNA will only bind to the specific target DNA sequence because they are complementary. The Cas9 enzyme follows the guide RNA to the same location, which is the specific target sequence, and makes the double cut across both uh, strands of DNA, creating this double-stranded break at the target sequence. Next to discuss is how making a double-stranded cut in the target sequence leads to a change in the genome. After the Cas9 enzyme makes a double-stranded cut at the target sequence, the target organism's body identifies this and tries to repair it as the DNA has been damaged. It is from the repair pathways that changes in the DNA target sequence occur. There are two main pathways of repair that are used. Firstly, you have non-homologous end joining. This produces an insertion or deletion of bases, also known as a knockout, at the target sequence. Therefore, changing the order of bases at the sequence. This is a less precise method and is used more experimentally and very useful in experiments as well. The next method of repair is known as homologous directed repair. This uses homologous DNA, which are similar slash identical molecules of DNA, in this case the target sequence. From a donor, from a donor template, that surrounds a section of the modified DNA that is to be inserted. Uh, if you look at the picture on the right, it's the dark blue section. The aim is to repair the double strand cut caused by the Cas9 enzyme. The repair occurs between homologous regions, which allows the insertion of a modified DNA, introducing a change into the target sequence. This repair pathway can be, can, can be precisely controlled, unlike non-homologous end joining making this mode of repair much more useful for future potential clinical uses. Therefore, scientists use these repair pathways to introduce changes to the target DNA sequence and therefore specific genes of the organism. So what are the future and current uses of CRISPR-Cas9? Firstly, we'll start off in humans. So currently, scientists believe that CRISPR-Cas9 has a lot of potential to treat in many medical conditions that have a genetic component. Lot, uh, 
These are conditions which are largely caused by a presence of a specific gene or a specific gene mutation or a number of genes. Some examples of these include muscular dystrophy, cystic fibrosis and Huntington's disease. They believe by changing or removing slash knocking out the target DNA sequence which causes the genes, they can prevent or reduce the risk of the disease occurring. CRISPR-Cas9 has already been used to treat a small number of people with life-threatening diseases. However, it's still much thought to be uh, future use and not used much in the current day. Another use includes uh, the use of germline cell editing. So many of the proposed uses for CRISPR-Cas9 today involves editing somatic cells. These are non-reproductive cells. However, there is this interest in editing germline cells, which are reproductive cells, and what that might behold in the future. So with germline cell editing, any changes that have been made will be passed on from generation to generation. Therefore, if a mother has a germline cell edited, this edit will be passed on to her children and so on. The problem with this is that there are ethical issues. So the child cannot um, have consented to this as they wouldn't have been born. Um, therefore, there is a huge ethical problem with no consent. And this is why it's not currently used and is why it's actually illegal in many countries, which includes the UK. But this is this is a future potential use that they are looking into. There are also some current uses of CRISPR-Cas9 being used in animals today. Similar to how they're used in humans, CRISPR-Cas9 can be used to prevent animal disease through modifying slash knocking out or removing a target sequence of DNA which would cause disease. Additionally, CRISPR-Cas9 provides a pivotal role in transgenesis in animals. Transgenesis is a completely different process, but involves inserting a gene into a genome or organism that wasn't previously present. For inserting this new gene, they can yield positive traits on the animal. For example, better yield of meat on livestock, reduced risk of animal disease, etc. However, there is always ethical complications when gene editing of animals is concerned. An example of CRISPR-Cas9 being used to edit slash knockout target DNA to treat animals disease is uh, PRRS in pigs. So many pigs every year suffer from a virus known as PRRS, which causes many abortions in pregnant pigs and causes significant losses for farmers. The virus attaches to a single protein called CD163 and specifically on a section of it called Domain 5. By using CRISPR-Cas9, scientists have been able to edit this protein section and remove Domain 5 from the pig. As a result, the virus cannot bind in the pig and therefore the pig does not suffer from PRRS. The pig also has no negative effects caused by having Domain 5 or CD163 removed. This is an example of a knockout modification. An example of transgenesis being used to reduce the risk of animal disease and increase the yield of the animal could be for dairy cows. Many cows suffer from mastasis, uh, which inflames the cow's mammary glands, uh, which are the milk glands, and reduces the yield of milk. Mastasis is caused by a bacterium called Staphylococcus aureus. Lysostathin is an antimicrobial substance that can kill this bacteria. Therefore, using CRISPR-Cas9, scientists have enabled cows to secrete lysostathin uh, through inserting a gene which expresses litho lysostathin. As a result of this, cows which secrete lysostathin are resistant to mastasis, uh, which improves the yield of milk. These are two examples of how CRISPR-Cas9 is used in the current day. Humans and animals are not the only targets for CRISPR-Cas9, as gene editing in plants can also be done. Genetic manipulation of plants already occurs in the present day by crossbreeding and selection. However, genetic editing of plants could be a much quicker and less labour-intensive process. By using CRISPR-Cas9, they can edit the genome of the plant and in turn provide it more positive traits, i.e. drought resistance, uh, better yield and uh, pesticide resistance. Similarly to animals, transgenesis using CRISPR-Cas9 is also possible, providing the plant a gene that provides beneficial effects. An example of transgenesis uh, for plants could be the insertion of genes which express uh, toxins such as Bt toxin. Bacillus thuringiensis is the bacteria which expresses the Bt toxin, uh, which is a highly lethal toxin to many insects. As a result, scientists have identified the gene which expresses this toxin in the bacteria and by using CRISPR-Cas9 have inserted it into the plant. This enables the plant to secrete Bt toxin. 
This is beneficial as it allows the plant to be more insect resistant and also reduces the need uh, for insecticides, which have negative effects on the environment. So those were some current uses of CRISPR-Cas9, but what does the future of CRISPR-Cas9 look like? CRISPR-Cas9 is still very much considered future technology, with the current uses in human medicine limited. However, there is a lot of current research on isolated human cells and uh, animal models. Scientists are also working to fine-tune the method of CRISPR-Cas9 in order to eliminate off-target effects, so this is when CRISPR-Cas9 cuts a different gene to the intended one. They are also aiming to design better and more specific guide RNAs, ensuring the cut is made at the correct location. Despite the current uses of CRISPR-Cas9 in animals and plants, whether that's providing a role in transgenesis or knocking out a harmful gene, the main aim and future goal of this technology is for it to be used routinely in, to treat human diseases. This will likely not happen in many years, however due to the work of scientists today, this goal is getting closer and closer to reality. Thank you for listening today. We hope you enjoyed the talk. Um, if you do have any questions or queries from the talk, please email askanambassador at canterbury.ac.uk where James and other fellow ambassadors will be more than happy to take your questions.